Friday at quitting time, Jim said, Boss, have you got any extra work I can do tonight? Sure do, but I can't pay you overtime. I said, well, that's okay. I just don't want to go home. Why not? Well, been in the doghouse last night. I see. Why? What did you do to deserve that? Well, I still don't know. It must be one of those woman things. I was minding my own business, relaxing in front of the TV. My wife enters the room and asks, what's on the TV? And honestly, I swear, all I said was dust. <laughs> She's been at me ever since. <laughs> Some of you are a little slow. <laughs> Turn to Luke chapter 18. I don't any of that. Luke chapter 18, <laughs> verse 27. And I want you to keep this one thing in mind as we continue on throughout the year is believing God for the impossible. And once you have done that, and once you have experienced that, you'll never want to go back to the normal. That will become the normal in your life. Luke chapter 18, verse 27. But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Now, just before Jesus said those words, I told a story about a rich young ruler. And this young man had asked Jesus, he said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you know the commandments. And the young man said, yes. And I've kept them all through my life. And when Jesus heard that, he said, yes, but you still have a problem. Just one thing. And this is what I want you to do. He said, I want you to take everything. I want you to sell everything and give it to the poor and come, follow me. And then you will have treasures in heaven. It says this man became very sorrowful because he was very rich. Why would he become sorrowful? Because we believe he couldn't get beyond the point that riches that he can see is what that he trusts. But God gave us the hope when he said, with God all things are possible. The impossibilities that we have in ourselves, when we include Christ, they become possible. When the rich young ruler said that I can't, it's because he was leaving God out of the equation. So much like many of us. When God says I want you to do something, and we think, oh yes, I can do that, and then we forget that we need to keep God in the middle of the equation. Moses did the same thing. When God approached Moses, he, Moses gave excuses. Again, like, but God, I can't. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to speak, and I can't speak well. It's so amazing to me how relevant the Word of God is to us today. It reaches to us and explains things just right where we are. We sound just like Moses. God speaks to our hearts. And we say, but God, I can't. I can't do that. Why do you keep putting me into situations like that, God? <laughs> God, you can't really expect me to do that, do you? You know what? You're right. He really doesn't expect you to do that. He doesn't expect you to do all those things on your own or without him. In other words, again, God keeps, we need to keep God in the equation. 
Moses is a perfect example of the process of learning to keep God in the equation. To keep God in the heart of the decision-making process. And remember I said, learning. When we learn, we go through situations. Amen. Moses was learning. The Israelites were wandering, wandering in the desert. And at this point, they had no water. So, of course, the nation of Israel was complaining, and who do you think they were directing their complaints to? They were directing them to Moses and Aaron. So Moses and Aaron did the right things. They went before God, and they began to seek God. They went to the tabernacle, or translated in my common English, is they went to the church, and they began to seek God. And it says, then the Lord spoke to them, and God told them, to get the people together and speak to the rock. How many of us would think that that's a little odd? God wants us to speak to the rock. But you did hear me right. Speak to the rock and it will yield water. So Moses and Aaron got everybody together. And Moses took his rod and struck the rock twice. Now, did you catch what just happened? Yeah. yeah. He didn't do it how God told him to do it. And it was because of that decision of Moses that he was never able to enter into the promised land. Yeah. It was a hard lesson to learn. They had an answer from God. They go and ask God. God answers them and gives them specific instructions but didn't trust the answer that God gave him. Anyone familiar with that? Anyone have a, <laughs> that ever happened in your life? <laughs> but God, what are you talking about? I'm going to do it this way. Because I know this way will work. No, I told you, this is how I want you to do it. <laughs> Moses had used what he was accustomed to using which was his rod. He had his rod with him everywhere. He took it everywhere he went, and oftentimes God told him to use his rod, but this time, he told him to use his voice. He said, speak to the rod. Bottom line, he asked for God's help, and then left him out of the equation. I want to pause just for a moment about this speaking to a rock bit. <laughs> God tells us to speak to the mountain, and the mountain will be removed. And as a result of it following the scripture and the pattern that the scripture teaches us, oftentimes when situations arise, I, I will speak peace in the name of God into the situation that's ready to blow up in front of us. I'll speak comfort to a person that's troubled, a mom that's troubled, or a dad that's troubled. And I'll also speak healing into people's bodies as God directs us to do that. And another one, I remember how God did it. When Peter got out and walked on the water and Jesus said, and the storm had, was, it was stormy and God said, or Jesus said, peace, be still. God spoke to that specific situation. Now, another illustration of believing God for the impossible is Abraham and Sarah. We always talk about Abraham. We seldom talk much about Sarah. But I want us to look at Sarah this morning. Sarah walked with Abraham into the unknown. We all know that Abraham would be the father of nations. But who was going to be the mother of nations? It was Sarah. Sarah was accustomed to following after her husband and doing what God had spoke to her husband to do. The father of nations and that his descendants would be like the stars in the sky. Now we all know that Sarah was old and past the age of bearing children. 
So when she was told she would have a child, she laughed. Scripture says that she laughed, not out loud, but she laughed. And you know how we do sometimes? We turn our head and cover our mouth and just kind of chuckle. When something just sounds impossible and somebody tells us to do something, you get right. That's never going to work. And that's what Sarah did. She chuckled. And Sarah here is saying to herself, you know, you've got to be kidding. I'm old. You know I can't have children. And the Lord looked at Abraham and said, why did Sarah laugh? Is there anything too hard for God? And then she denied that she laughed. And you know what? We often criticize Sarah for having done that very thing. She denied that she had done something that she actually had done to God. But wouldn't you laugh too? If you're told something that sounds totally impossible, and God says, I want you to do this, or in this case, if you see a guy walk out of the desert, walk up to you and tell you you're going to have a baby, and just the sound of it makes me chuckle as I read it. Sarah, having waited all these years, having all those years of hoping, of waiting, of anticipating, and also of disappointments. When you turn in the scriptures to Hebrews 11, verse 11, the scripture shares or assures with us that in spite of the laughter, Sarah had faith in God. God's promise and Sarah's faith took the impossible and made it all possible. Made the impossible become possible in Sarah's life. Now it's interesting in Luke chapter 1 verse 27, one of Sarah's descendants said, For with God, nothing will be impossible. Sometimes we laugh when... God promises as, as a miracle that has impossible written all, all over it. And I'd like to say to the impossible, impossible, you're going down. I'm going to live the possible. Impossible, you're going down. Amen. I look at the miracle God has for me and, he, and, and I say that miracle is mine. Claim it. Hang on to it. When God has spoke that promise into my heart, I claim that promise and know that God has meant it for me. God has a history of taking things that we see as impossible and making them possible. And I'm sure you remember the story of Gideon, which I'm not going to share with you the whole story, but his army of 300 men Defeating an army of 32,000. No general in his right mind would ever take 300 men and go to battle against 32,000. But God spoke to his heart, and he kept God in the equation, and they won. God caused a spirit of confusion on that army of 32,000, and they defeated themselves. God made the impossible possible as he used a willing vessel. And that willing vessel was named Gideon. If God can create this entire universe, creating everything out of nothing, then how can he not do the impossible in your life? In fact, the more impossible it seems, the more God wants to do it. I hear a story that I'm told is true. It's about a group of soldiers who were on the battlefield. One of the young soldiers became separated from the main group. He found himself in a rocky and heavily wooded area. And all alone, the soldier heard the footsteps of the enemy troops coming. Quickly, the soldier kept climbing up the hilly terrain, trying to get away, and he saw a few small, darkened caves. 
Maybe I could just hide in one of these, he said. There was no time to consider any other option, and as the enemy was approaching him, without delay, the soldier bent down and got into one of those small caves. Safe within the cave, he let out a sigh of relief, and then listening intently, he heard the enemy troops louder and louder, getting closer and closer. Sitting as quietly as possible, the soldier waited in the cave with a sense of peace, believing that everything was going to be all right. With an upward glance, the soldier then saw a little spider crawling on the top of the cave. He watched as the spider spun a strong web and another strand. And miraculously, the spider began building this large web over the entire opening of the cave. Nearby, the enemy troops were searching, and the soldier could hear them coming, hear them searching cave by cave. The enemy troops came, and they says, there's nothing in here, and they went on to the next one. He saw the spider web covering the entrance to the cave. He says, there can't be anything in here. He took the impossible, the things that you and I would begin to think are totally impossible, and used the spider to make it possible. God wants us to trust Him. In fact, as we go through life, He continually reminds us of this fact by what we go through. God hasn't led us this far to abandon us or to give up on us. If faith never encounters doubts, if truth never battles with evil, how can faith know its own power? What do you think about that? As you go through situations in life, as you go through trials in life that seem totally impossible, how can you know that they will be, that God will use the impossible to become possible if you don't go through those situations? How can faith know its own power? In other words, if our faith is never put to the test, we will never know what it can do. And if I had to choose between a faith that has stared down in the eyes and made it blank, or a naive faith that has never been battle tested, which one would you choose? And when I face spiritual warfare or when I face situations in my life, I've decided that I like to have the assurance that my personal faith in Jesus Christ has been battle tested, has been put to the test, so that when the real trials come, we'll be able to overcome. Amen. No matter what hits us, we'll be able to overcome. We often ask God, why? Why am I going through this situation in my life? Why am I having to face this trial? God, you're just making it too hard on me. But allow him to battle test you. And allow him to put your faith to the test. And you will come out on top. And it's because of that I can remove myself from the trial and trust God for the impossible. Trusting him for the impossible. If God is able to raise an army from a valley of dead bones, and yes, he did, in Ezekiel chapter 37, imagine for a moment what he can do with you and I. Think about that. Now, I'm not calling you a valley of dead bones. <laughs> but imagine what he can do with you and I, knowing what he has already done in history, knowing what he has already done in your life, already. 
Imagine what God can do with a life that trusts Him. Now, in the Bible, the list of people God has called to do the impossible goes on and on. God has always chosen ordinary people to do the impossible. Some were men, some were women, some were young, some were old, some were smart, some weren't. But they all had something in common. They had been called by God to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And because of their willingness to be used of God, God used them in impossible situations. A lady named Catherine Kuhlman, many of you may not know her, know who she was, but once said, it isn't silver vessels God is asking for. It isn't golden vessels that he needs. It's willing vessels. It's willing people. People that are ready and willing to be used by God. Many of you are facing troubling situations. Situations that are very difficult in your life. You don't know how God's going to work, work through them. You don't know how God's going to work it out. You may be worried. You may be afraid. But if God can direct a spider to protect a soldier's life, think of all the ways that God can work in your life. God is in the process of taking the impossible in your life and turning it into the possible. You spread the letters of parts in this word impossible. It spells I am possible. When I was sitting down, I was just looking at that word impossible. First thing I did, I crossed off the first two letters. And I'm going, impossible turns into possible. Well, wait a minute. Let's spread this out a little bit. I am possible. With God, all things are possible in your life. With God. Do not take him out of the equation, because if you do, then it's not possible. But when you leave God in the equation, everything is possible with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to say thank you for your word. Thank you for encouraging us in you, Lord. And God, I know so many here have situations in their life that are tough, that are trying. Sometimes we feel like giving up. But God, when we know that you are at the heart of our situation, and as we keep you in the heart of that situation, Lord, everything's impossible. There's nothing that you cannot do in our lives. Father, I just trust that we continue to put our trust our faith in you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.